mover and shaker in Lafayette um, at his home. And we'll go through the, um, uh, the sequential questions. So Mike, what are your first and best childhood memories of libraries? Well, my library was named for a woman named Ruth Bach, B-A-C-H, who uh, was a beloved librarian in Long Beach, California, where I grew up. And uh, <clears throat> Ruth's son became a very famous writer by the name of Richard Bach, who wrote Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Right, right. Yeah, and, <clears throat> and when the Ruth Bach Library was being built, my mother was president of the PTA and was very actively involved in the effort to get it built. And I remember as a young person, uh, there was no sidewalk leading up a fairly busy street to get to the library. So my mother got the newspaper out with their camera and a reporter showing my brother and I and some other friends walking on a busy street uh, to make the point to the city council that they ought to allocate the money to build a sidewalk to the library. So that, that's my first real memory of libraries. The, the lack of sidewalks. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, that happened to me in Palo Alto. I was delivering papers without sidewalks and it was pretty muddy. Yes. Um, and how important was reading to you in, while you were growing up? Oh, reading was my, reading was my uh, way to explore the world. Your you passion. Know, it was my passion, and I, I remember, you know, early on as a boy. I mean, in the 1950s, um, a lot of the early books were books about sports, particularly baseball, which I was always very interested in. But beyond that, it was, you know, there were books about different parts of the world, and my father traveled all the time, and so reading for me was a way to get connected to what he was doing, oh. and uh, so we always had lots of books in the house, and and I. You know, I, I think for some reason, reading and education were very important. You know, my sister's a PhD professor at University of California at San Diego and knew she wanted to be a professor from the time she was 10. And my brother's a tenured professor at the University of Maine. So oh. somehow in this family, you know, reading and learning were, were sort of important values. But for me, books, definitely. Books definitely, yeah. Well, it sounds like a bright family. Uh, Kind of like the kid I was just telling you about. Um, and how about uh, any favorite childhood books you can remember? Oh boy, you know one one that sort of really comes to mind was was uh, Bridey of the Grand Canyon, which was I, I don't know a, a book you read when you're about eight or ten years old, and for some reason it's it's just one that that uh, um, I recall being. Um, Here I can stop. Okay. Um, so it was called what, Bridey? Bridey of the Grand Canyon. And it was a book about a burrow that used to go down into the Grand Canyon. And I'd never been to the Grand Canyon, so this book was my way to envision what the Grand Canyon looked like. Wow. Huh. Did you ever see it later to see that it looked like that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we took the kids a few years ago, and it was a great trip. And, and uh, I finally, you know, it, 50-something had gotten to see the Grand Canyon. Yeah, right. I'd love to go back. I've only been there once. Uh, let's see. We, uh, I heard you say you grew up in Long Beach. Was that the place you grew up? Yeah, I was born in Santa Monica. and uh, Oh, Santa Monica. Santa Monica, but grew up in Long Beach. And I lived there until I went in the service in 1966. Huh. And effectively left at that point for points oh. around the world. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, and uh, the awareness of community that you might have had growing up, um, the general, as a kid, did you have a feeling of, about community bigger than your family? Oh yeah, my, my, my mother in particular, my father was not terribly involved in the community, but because he was working all the time and gone a lot, but my mother was, my mother was very actively involved in community affairs throughout Long Beach and from PTA to uh, a whole variety of activities. So we were, we were early on sort of... Community people. E exactly. And so yeah. you just kept it up since the, it was new. Exactly. Uh, and uh, your education, that would be interesting. Well, I, I didn't start college until I was 23. I, I went in the military after high school 
because I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I came back, and, and it, was a, it was a difficult time to come back to the United States in, in 1970. It was not easy for right. men and women, mostly men in, in those days, who come back to the U.S. And, and um, I, I, I didn't have a lot of money, um, and the GI Bill was not nearly as generous as it is today. So I, my, my best choices were one of the campuses of the UC system, and I was, while I might have been interested in Berkeley or UCLA, they were just too intimidating for somebody getting out of the military at that time. So I went to Davis and had a great time and lived in, in, in Davis from 1971 to 1976. <clears throat> I actually worked there for, worked in Sacramento for three years after I graduated undergraduate. Um, and in fact, the last year that I lived in Davis, I was working in Sacramento for the California Post-Secondary Education Commission, um, doing work on, on financing of higher education and writing a five-year plan for education. But then I, it was time to, to move on, and, and um, I had sort of struggled with the, uh, what, what would I do next? I knew I wanted more education, but wasn't quite clear what it was going to be, and sort of went through all of the options. and ended up deciding to go to, to business school, get an MBA. And I decided that if I was going to go, I wanted to go full time because I watched people who'd gone to school part time and it seemed like such a hard thing to do to balance between school and work. And so I decided I want to go full time and I decided that if I was going to go, I wanted to go to a well-regarded institution. And Business school was not yet, at that time, was not yet real popular. It hadn't made the cover of Time Magazine yet, but I, I'd done enough research to know that of some good schools. So I, I applied to four schools um, and really wanted to go east um, because I'd lived out of the U.S. when I was in the service, but had never been to Philadelphia or New York or Boston or any of those places. So um, with good fortune, I, I ended up going to school at Wharton in the University of Pennsylvania right. in Philadelphia and loved it. It was great fun and made some great friends and <clears throat> um, was involved in a variety of things on the campus at Penn mm -hmm. um, while I was in business school um, and trying to pay my way through on the GI Bill. So that was my education. Yeah, good, yeah. Well, my brother was an undergraduate at University of Pennsylvania. Oh, is that right? <laughs> From Los Lomas High School, he went straight there. Um, that's great. And then uh, post your biz ad uh, MBA, what did Well, my first job after business school, uh, I was hired by a consulting firm that I knew very little about, but it was intriguing because they were the first company to give me an offer in business school. And I was president of the, of the class at the time, and I was living in an undergraduate dormitory, and I was involved in the university's c uh, committee on, on, on uh, education planning um, for the future at Penn, so a company called McKinsey came along and gave me an offer to join their Washington office, and I didn't know at the time, you know, what a marvelous experience this was going to be and what a great firm McKinsey is, and so I went to McKinsey in 1978 and stayed until 1984, um, by which time I'd worked my required number of 18-hour days and yeah. seven-day weeks, and, and I was by then married um, and my wife to the woman whom I met at McKinsey, who had graduated the same year I graduated from Wharton, but she graduated from Stanford. Mm -hmm. So, and it was, it was time to do something different. So I went to work for what was at the time a small aviation company in the U.S. called Airbus. Oh, Airbus. Right, and there were uh, 16 of us in a small office in New York City at the time, and uh, grew the company over the next five years to 125 people, and had moved to Virginia and sold lots of airplanes, and then from there um, really had an itch to come back to California, hmm. and uh, so I, I joined GE Capital selling and leasing airplanes in San Francisco, which is how we came back to California and how we ended up in Lafayette wow. was, was um, through the GE Capital job. Hmm. And, and we, uh, we ended up in Lafayette because I knew exactly two people who lived in Orinda, 
exactly two. Yes. Exactly two, who, who encouraged us to look in La Mirinda for a place to live, and we were thinking about starting a family at the time, and so this was an intriguing place. So we've been in Lafayette since we came back to California in 1990. Wow, that's a good, a very good track. Um, and as an adult, you had some early community experiences. I heard that education, <coughs> you've always been involved in education, it seems. Well, I, I, one of the things I did when we came back to California, I mean, was to make a commitment to get as actively involved as we could in community-related activities. So uh, probably my first activity I got involved with when we came back was what used to be called Christmas in April, now oh. called Rebuilding Together. Yeah. And I ended up uh, rehabbing oh, more than a half a dozen houses and a, a similar number of community centers and serving on the board for eight years or so of Rebuilding Together. Um, and about 1995 or so, uh, the city of Lafayette was looking at the idea of a new library as a possibility in a, in a new city offices. So um, I was asked to serve on, on that committee in, in 1995. So that the rebuilding together, the city, and then a lot of work with St. Perpetua and some other organizations as well. I believe that, you know, we're put here to to, to give back. To, to give back. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a common thread for a lot of people. Uh, so you've already kind of talked about attracted to Lafayette, and you've lived here since 1980. Was was there any other attraction to Lafayette besides getting back to California, or knowing the two people in Orinda? We, we knew nothing about Lafayette when we moved here in 1990. We, I, we, we were so naive that we didn't even know of this marvelous Lafayette Moraga bike trail. We knew nothing about the Lafayette Reservoir. We knew certainly nothing about all the wonderful people here. Right. We knew we knew uh, my friends Tom and Amy Worth from Marinda, and that was it. And uh, Tom and Amy were gracious in introducing us to some of their friends, and so the circle began. And, and we got really involved in Lafayette um, when my wife became pregnant with our oldest daughter, who's now a freshman in college, and we were looking around for a pediatrician. Right. And somebody recommended this this uh, kind man by the name of Dr. Peter Sheaf oh, Peter Sheaf, yeah. at La Marinda Pediatrics. And, and we went in and met with Peter, and the first thing I saw on Peter's wall was a, was a poster of, of running. And so Peter and I started talking about running, and he said, well, you must join the Arinda Roadrunners. Oh. And the Arinda Roadrunners became my window to the La Marinda community. Oh. And um, from there, you know, many of the people that I still consider to be among my closest friends in La Marinda are people that I met through the Roadrunners. The Roadrunners, yeah. Including the fellow who's building our new library, Jerry Obra. Sure, uh -huh. <clears throat> so Peter, Peter was my, if you will, my introducer to the La Marinda community and, and uh, Lafayette, by extension of that, you know, I just, I decided this was a great place and it was some place that I wanted to be involved with. And, and it turns out quite by very strange coincidence that Steve Falk, who's the manager of, city manager of Lafayette, had grown up near where I grew up and my next door neighbor worked for Steve's dad. And I didn't know this until several years after we had moved to Lafayette. So Steve and I became friends because of this connection huh. in you never say no to Steve. No, right, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, see, the defining, this might be something interesting, defining the goals of a community as a place of mutual support, shared values, and acceptance of difference. How do you see Lafayette meeting? Are we really meeting these goals? Well, I don't think you ever meet the goals. I think what you do is you try to get as close as you can, and, and to me, you know, one of the great strengths of Lafayette is is the is the people and their commitment to making this a better place to live. And you know, I I mean, for me, what's what's always been fascinating is how I know people in this community, um, many of them from more than one connection. Yeah. I mean, they're 
my friend Stephanie Teichman, who sits in the pew in front of me often at St. Perpetua. I know through this, you know, work with the schools, and I know her through St. Perpetua, and she serves on my governance committee for the library board, so. And Teresa Garinger, you know, and I worked together for years at the, uh, for Springbrook swim team, mm -hmm. <clears throat> as well as doing school-related activities, so. We just know people in a variety of contexts. And, uh, you know, I, I really do think that this is a place where people are not satisfied. Um, they they want to make it better. Right. Yeah, that's a, a big a big value I think we can all share, regardless of our background. Um, and your, your earliest memories of our current library well, this is one of the surprises. I mean, when I when I first saw the library, it uh, my first reaction was, this doesn't fit with this community. This is a community that a little small. This is a community that where education is is and and learning are just part of the fabric of the community. And then I saw this library that with you know with which was horribly outdated and way too small for the community and we started looking at you know that's when I started scratching my head and saying why is this the way it is and it wasn't too long after that that I was asked to serve on the committee to think about whether it was appropriate for there to be a new library and I started looking at all the statistics and realizing that you know the the capacity was, they were at capacity with books so that every time you would want to bring a new book into the library, you had to take one out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the ceiling leaked and, and all the other things that we know to be faults of the existing library were, were there and, and it sort of was reinforced with the work on the committee. So, and that was about 1994 or so. Mm -hmm. And my, so my oldest was three or four years old and just starting to go to the library and of course, <clears throat> in our house, you, you know, that's one of the places they get the kids should get introduced to early on is the library. Library, right? Yeah, you'd hope more parents would have that <clears throat> uh, or see that good connection. Um, early memories we just did that. Of the, and how often do you personally use library? I guess you did it when you had kids. Well, yeah. I mean, what especially? <clears throat> I mean, the fact that. The fact that both of my kids went to Stanley meant that, close. you know, it was close. Um, and and my kids have always been one that th thought it was a treat to go to the library and check out books. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I mean, we we made going to the library a part of our regular routine. Right. Um, from you know, and the kids are now 18 and 14, but they. You know, the, the library was just something that they that they thought of as, as an important part of the community. Um, do you have any special, did you have any special things that you yourself like to get out of the library? I was, you know, I, I'm, I love books. And in this house, there are books stuck everywhere. And, and Dave Simpson's bookstore is, has been a, a place that I've gone to for a long time. So. I buy books a lot. I don't check out books a lot. What I did with the library with the kids was I would go in and find a, a cozy place to sit right. and just allow them to explore and encourage them if they found an author they liked to, to, to go back and get the second book or the third book or the fourth book by that author. Right. So mine was more, my. For me, the value of the library was more as a place to get the kids connected with reading and learning. Right, and a place maybe for you to hang out. Yeah, with the exactly. To read and exactly. Catch up on your own reading. Um, and how do you feel a library serves a community? Well, or how about our library serving our community? <laughs> well, I, I, I think you know you have to put it in context. I mean, the, the existing library that will be leaving in a matter of a few weeks um, 
it, it has a limited capacity to serve the community just because of its size and space constraints. So right. the way it serves the community is gonna be fundamentally different than the new library. Obviously, the, the existing library, you know, Miss Donna Story Hour, you know, plays a wonderful role for young kids, for um, older adults that have a little bit of leisure time, they could maybe find a space to sit and read the newspaper or read a book. But the new library is going to go so far beyond that in terms of being a, a really a community gathering place. And if you look at what's happened with Orinda, mm -hmm. you know, when they built their new library, the library became much more than a building with books. Oh, much more, yeah. That's and and that's, that's clearly our objective for, for our new library is, is a place where people can, can see that location and use it in a variety of contexts, whether it's attending a city council meeting, attending a commonwealth club meeting, going there as a kid for after school, for tutoring, for study hall, um, for any of us who, who have an hour and want to spend it with a book in a quiet location in the library. It's going to be all of those things. Right. Seems like it gives more avenues for education. Sure, sure. Um, and you've been, um, have, you have been, you just mentioned a few minutes ago, you've been involved in the library over the years. And is there any other way you were involved? In well, I mean, the main thing was the, uh, and I think it was about 1995, the City Offices Task Force, which, which was really charged with sort of thinking about whether the city offices and the library should be rethought, you know, and, and it became clear early on, I think to many of us on the committee, um, that we did need a new library that it made most sense for that library to be as centrally located as possible. And, you know, then the seed was planted and it, it obviously took a while for all of the pieces to fit in place and for the veterans to find out that, that they could have a new wonderful facility and not be in the location where the new library will be. And I mean, that just took a while for that consensus to build among the veterans. Right. Um, because I think early on there was a sense that they wanted to stay in their old location. And that was clearly, I think, in the minds of many of us on the committee, the old location for the Veterans Hall where our new library will be, it was by far and away the best location for a library right. that we could even possibly consider um, from a standpoint of, of its centrality, its, its traffic, all of the things it's the size of the lot that gave us the room to be a bit broader than we might have been otherwise. So any place else we looked at would have had real limitations. And this one was, so it, it just took a while after our committee issued its report. Um, so, uh, you know, my, my involvement really started in 1994, I think. Hmm. The, so the, the politics with the veterans must have been excruciating to get them to see the light that maybe we could move to a different location. Well, that, that's right. You know, I mean, there's some, there's always some attachment to a building that people have used for a long period of time. And I mean, the veterans, for many of them, um, who might have been there perhaps from as long ago as the late 1940s, that old building had special memories. So the idea of, of uprooting them to a new location was something that took a while for people to to get comfortable with and you know and then all of the marvelous work that was done by the cities of Lafayette and Walnut Creek and the county um, to put the pieces in place to allow this new veterans facility to be built right. um, I think those all had to happen um, be, before we could think about that location as a as a library, because it was clear early on when we we as a committee were deliberating locations that there was that the that that location had a great deal of sensitivity for many of the veterans, right. and I'm a veteran, so I can understand the attachment. But it still, I think this ends up being a win-win situation. Right. You know, I think uh, even our Rotary Club, we had members who did not want to leave that location. <laughs> exactly. Go to, to Plastino. Um, 
And other community events or projects that you've been involved, you mentioned St. Perpetua's, are there others? Well, I, I, I was recently um, uh, a member of the c committee from the city of Lafayette for, to, to do its, its review of the city's finances. So I spent, I guess, the better part of six or nine months on that committee. Um, the city's finances, about every 10 years or so, the city likes to have a group of citizens not connected with any of the committees or commissions of the, of the city look at how the city is, is uh, raising money and how it's spending its money. And so that's what we, we spent the better part of you know, six months, I guess, looking at those and making a report to the city. And, and I think that reinforced for me that the things that we were doing with respect to how the new library was going to be funded were, were on solid ground. On, on target. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay, Mike Gilson, it's been a real pleasure. Is, are there any closing ideas you'd like to... No, I just can't wait for the new... Uh, <laughs> I can't wait for the ribbon to be cut on the 14th of November. It's like a... At this point, it's like a kid waiting for Christmas morning. You know, uh, I've been in there a number of times, and every time it seems to be getting closer, but not quite there. So I can't wait for the 14th of November. Right. Do you think they're going to make it? Yes. Okay, good. Yes, I'm quite confident of that. So it's over is on the... On the on the job. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're back to Mike Gilson, uh, and I see I overlooked a couple of questions. W one is, what is your opinion about how the, the impact of the Internet is going to be upon the, the way li our library functions? Well, I, I think with the new libraries, we, as we talked before, the library becomes more than just a a building with books. So uh, the internet the internet I think will have a positive effect because what it will do is it will allow us to gain information more quickly but at the same time um, you know have the library be a resource for people that actually want to see a physical product. So I you know we talked about this gosh in the 1990s on the committee was the internet going to um, be a means by which libraries were no longer uh, of the v benefit or value that they were in the community before. And I think what we've seen since, since our committee met in the mid-1990s that, in fact, every new library that's opened, um, the, the attendance exceeds expectations and that the Internet has not diminished interest in a library. It's only enhanced it. Enhanced it, yeah, good. Okay, and there was a, is there anybody that you, or anything I think you, uh, or let me rephrase that, is there anyone else you think we ought to contact for an interview? Oh boy, I, I mean, I'm sure you've got a pretty, yeah, got a pretty, list. pretty long list of people, so without seeing your list, I mean, I just, I think it's going to be fun to, to maybe get some one second or two second sound bites from people when the new library opens and ask them how this meets their expectations. You know, have we done our job in designing in building a building to meet the needs of people in the community? Because a, a lot of people, I think, because they've not been inside and because they've not been intimately involved in it, they may have their own expectations right. and I would certainly hope that we've at least met if not exceeded the community's expectations I mean we can pat ourselves on the back and say what a great job we've done we've raised a lot of money and we've gotten you know an extraordinary amount of support from the community but I want to make sure that people I want to make sure that people really feel excited about this place Good. I think maybe that would be your soundbite if you yeah. had a soundbite. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Great. Okay. Um, any final thoughts? That's it. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.